So now you have two books on food under your belt. What next? What next? I love Goa. I love Goa and yeah. uh, there is a beautiful, beautiful haunting story. It's really haunting. Uh, Fiction? It's based on a true story. Okay. It's based on a true story. And uh, the whole, it's named The Shadow of the Temptress. Okay. What really inspired me to write this story is of late, a lot of this adverse publicity which has been coming about Goa as a place, you know, the yeah. uh, talk about the rapes and the drugs and the, the murders and all these sort of things. I somehow or the other felt it was like a shadow which was being cast over Goa. And then I heard a story which is a, a, maybe a commonplace story because in those days this was a woman who did not belong to a very affluent sect of, uh, section of Goa. Uh, and uh, she was forced into a marriage uh, basically because her father uh, felt that by her marrying a, a person who was in the Gulf was able to take care of the education of the younger brothers and all. Mm -hmm. And here was this Goan girl who gets married, pressure from the church, pressure from the parents, not, not educated because in that, that, that time food standard yeah. passed, you know, that level yeah. was fine. And then after some time she really falls in love. She falls in love with somebody else. and. The very people who should have supported her at that point of time just went against her, including the church, uh, where, you know, they say that the divorce was taboo against the religion mm -hmm. and all these sort of things. And what frustrations that woman was going through and how she took it out on her children. Right. You know, the, the whole family environment of the home and how it was this. Now, they considered her a temptress. Because so here we'll, we'll interrupt because we leave this to the reader to, oh, okay, okay. to wait for us to wait. So don't, what actually don't give really? the full plot away. <laughs> All don't right, that's it. Don't give the full plot away. <laughs> but it sounds, yeah, it sounds very interesting. But these two books on food, I mean, they are going to define you for the rest of your writing career. People will see you and your column also, your column on food. And plus the TV show. TV show. People yeah. are going to see you as very much of a food person. I guess so. But you know, right from the beginning, I'll share with you, I always... Uh, what I would love to write books of different genres. Um, you know, I uh, we're talking about my children book series. The reason Alfie why I wrote Alfonso. The, Alfie Alfonso. In fact, when I wrote that book, uh, somebody told me that you've written something in terms of management where the Maskey was concerned. It went into a lot of catering colleges, even as a research book. I see. You know, for people who are joining and wanting to become chefs. And then somebody, we are management consultants, and somebody turned around and told me, listen, what about the teens? They're so confused today. Why don't you do something about it? So the Alfie Alfonso series was management, come fantasy, yeah. fiction, totally fiction. For whatever reason, maybe, I don't know whether I did it because I do my own uh, sort of distribution and with the help of yeah. Joe. And uh, whether we went about it in the wrong way, whether Goa is too small a uh, market to perhaps, you it know. Is, it is a small market, though we have. Yeah, to push yeah. these books ahead. Uh, people who have read the book, at least the first one, you know, because we managed to, 1,500 were printed, we managed to sell nearly 1,300, 200 a balance, I see. Yeah. I see. 200 a balance, uh, because we really went aggressively with that one. Uh, people read the book, they found it very interesting, very interesting. They, they made comments like, it does not have the dark side of magic. It's a very optimistic uh, yeah. part in which a, a child look, uh, going through the, you know, the thing of Alfie Alfonso looks at life in a very, very buoyant way. A very Harry positive. Potter for Goa in a sense, was it? Some people perhaps, but again I asked people, I said, did you find, they said, yes, the magic is a part of the Harry Potter creed, which yeah. everybody talks about. I said, is there any similarity? Um, gave it to a lot of kids. They felt that maybe the management angle took a little bit out of that Harry Potter part of it. You know, when you talk about, uh, he's looking at potential, uh, I didn't read a Harry Potter, but I saw one movie, okay. that is that Goblet of Fire and all, and I still remember. I don't think there's anything in terms of how he develops as a person. I'm not, I, I don't think so. This is my viewpoint, yeah. it could be wrong. This was something which I was discussing. Uh, my first book was used for in a workshop. I, I used to go to schools, 11th, 10th and 12th standard, basically to make them work on the book and develop their soft skills. I see. Now somebody also turned around and told me, Audit, please for heaven's sake, don't call it a management book because children will not buy it. They told right, me. Right. So I never ever spoke about the management angle. I only spoke about the fantasy. Okay. But today I, am, I was just reading Arvindam Chaudhary's latest book, There's a Diamond in You, which is doing so well and it's a pure management book. And uh, you know, the way he has gone into 
uh, explaining how important it is for you to you know develop yourself and, and he is uh, doing a fantastic job with the distribution and the publishing I don't understand why even if it's a child's book a children's book for management why should there be this feeling that it won't sell with children mm -hmm. maybe there's a sort of a mindset or maybe uh, uh, children are too bogged down with reality so management again becomes right. reality they'd like to go more into fantasy so there are a lot of things which to my survey but one thing positive was there which made me do the sequel yeah. is I did a blind survey right. of the same 600 kids who I addressed and all of them said they wanted a sequel and that's right. why we put the blot on the canvas right. again on issues which are plaguing Goa blot on the canvas is the blot on the beautiful canvas which God has created and again with what are all these movements which are happening in Goa in terms yeah. of the building and all that the plot is there so that is something which triggered out. Any more books on food? You know, some of the other, I don't know, the food part will always creep in. Yeah. I've got two people who turned around and told me, uh, you know, we've got recipes and we'd like you to, you know, write something about uh, food. But unless the story angle is interesting, I don't, would not just want to write recipe books. Uh, there has to be something which is really, uh, you know, challenging for me to do. So. I guess so with my TV series. Now recently when I went to the Gorman uh, World Cookbook Awards, there was a category, the category which was there for the TV series if you take out a book on the TV series. Now if this TV series becomes interesting, which uh, I'm very happy to say today a lady who has come in from USA watched the show and she says, oh that I really liked, in fact I was just going to sleep at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and when I saw the program I really woke up and I, I watched see. it all throughout. And I just asked her, how would you rate it? And she says, I think it would be rated on par, on par. It may be a little, and like some of the things that we see abroad. So a good idea, maybe a book on the series. Perhaps. So maybe I would be toying around with that idea. And one last question, what memories do you have of your father-in-law, Maski? I never met the man. I see. I never ever met the man. But I still remember the first day I joined the Taj. Yeah. This was in 79. And uh, I saw him, uh, I was put in the kitchen as part of my training. Many Goans in the Taj then? Lots, lots. Wow. And those were all Goans who Maski had recruited. Right. There was Uncle John, there was uh, Camelio, there was, he was in the egg section, I still remember. What section? Egg, egg. The, the breakfast section. And that guy used to come drunk as a dodo. <laughs> but 5.30 in the morning, he was awake there because breakfast used to start early. Right. He could take two pans, two pans, and make a an Spanish omelette on one side and flip eggs on the other side. And at the back was the boiler where he used to poach his eggs and everything was running so smoothly alone, single-handedly, 650 rooms. I, I still remember Camilo and I, I would say, can I help? And he said, boss, stand up, stand up. And <laughs> I would just stand there and watch him in action. And then there was this... Uh, uh, Nicholas was in charge of the soup section. I still I remember those huge cauldrons of soup. They used to feed something like 400 people for lunch every day in the ballroom. I see. All these guys were taken in the Bento. Again, his name is mentioned in Maskey. He's still alive. He was one of the first recruits taken in 45 by Maskey. And uh, they were all walking there. And I still remember I had just joined the Taj and there was this old man walking up with a stick. Now, that day, I'd, I, at that time, I had not known Joe at all. So I saw this old man walking and I remember the executive chef Satish Arora was there and I was looking at him and he said, come here, come here, I see. Uh, don't do anything. Yeah. And I asked him, uh, who's that man? Because right. he was walking up towards the pastry section and he says, this man's name is spoken in hushed whispers. This is the greatest chef that India has produced. Right. And I had no clue. I had no clue who this man was because, see, I had joined him, yeah. you know, as a yuppie trainee. And, you yes. know, we think the youngsters knew everything and all. You know, everyone is talking in hushed tones and all that. There was that big photograph of his in the chef's cabin. I and I still remember looking at it and I said, wow, this is something for this man to have achieved so I much. See. 